Good morning. I'm going to be speaking this morning about Psalm 103. And it's a very good idea if you have your Bible to follow along as I speak about the verses in Psalm 103. I'm going to read it first. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So this psalm begins and ends with a command, bless the Lord. How can I, as a human being, bless the Lord? The writer to the Hebrews writes, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And then this is illustrated in, account, in an account of fathers blessing sons. Isaac blessed his son, Jacob, in Genesis 27, and Jacob blessed his 12 sons in Genesis 49. In the final analysis, a blessing can come only from God. The Lord God is the only source of blessing. So how can we as human beings bless the Lord? Well, obviously it is something that we can do because the Psalm writer who is inspired by the Holy Spirit said that we should. But we can bless the Lord only because we are his people. The word bless in the broad sense means to give good things. What can we give to God that he did not first give to us? The only thing we can give to God is praise. And in this Psalm, we could interpret the word bless as praise. In fact, the New International Version translates the word as praise. But the Psalm writer doesn't say praise the Lord which would be hallelujah. He says, bless the Lord. So there must be more to it than praise. The command that the Psalm writer gives in this Psalm is to himself. He is reminding himself to praise the Lord or to bless the Lord. When he says, bless the Lord, O my soul, he is speaking to himself. When he says, my soul, he means me. 
One, one commentator says that the psalmist is saying, bless the Lord, I tell myself. In the ancient Hebrew way of thinking, that is in the Old Testament way of thinking, I am not a creature of two separate parts, body and soul, or a creature of three separate parts, body, soul, and spirit. There used to be a debate among theologians about whether we consist of two parts or three. Those who thought we were made up of two parts were called dichotomists, and those who thought we were made up of three parts were called trichotomists. Now, I'm not sure what theologians are saying about that these days because I'm not a theologian. In any case, according to the ancient Hebrew way of thinking, I am a unit. My soul is me. We think of ourselves as having a soul. The ancient Hebrews thought of themselves as being a soul. There's no real contradiction here. It's just that we put a greater emphasis on the separation between the physical and spiritual aspects of ourselves. In the account of the creation of Adam in Genesis 2 verse 7, we read that the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. When we read this psalm, we have to understand that the psalm writer is telling himself to bless the Lord. Then he repeats his command or a self-command in a slightly different way. He says, everything that is in me, bless his holy name. So perhaps when he says, bless the Lord, instead of praise the Lord, he's giving us a clue as to what makes blessing richer than praising. The poet is reminding himself to put his whole life into his praising. Other psalms begin with praise the Lord or give thanks to the Lord. And these are reminders to us to use our voices to thank the Lord or to sing praises to him. But this psalmist is saying to himself, put your whole being into praising the Lord. The psalm writer is not only talking to himself, but he's also writing it down at the beginning of this poem that he is composing. He is recording his talk to himself for the benefit of the readers of this poem. And to make sure that we, the readers of this poem, don't miss the point, he repeats his first command, bless the Lord, O my soul. And then he adds a reminder to himself not to forget all the benefits that the Lord bestows upon him. He says, don't forget. Forgetting is something that uh, I'm very good at, and I'm getting better at it all the time. But before you get self-righteous, you too are good at forgetting. We human beings readily forget the good things that God has given us. And Moses, knowing this about his people, told them in Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 to 14. This is a passage that was read earlier, but I'm going to read it again. Deuteronomy 11, or 8, verses 11 to 14. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Lord also helped his people, Israel, to remember what he has done for them by giving them some festivals. He gave them the festival of Passover to remind them that they were saved from death by the blood of a lamb. He gave them the festival of Pentecost to celebrate the harvest and to remind them of his provision for their physical needs. He gave them the festival of tabernacles to remind them of his guiding and his leading as they were wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. 
we have the festivals of Good Friday and Easter to remind us of God's provision of salvation for us. The Lord does not want us to forget. So the psalmist says to himself and to us, don't forget the Lord's benefits. Then in verses three through five, he makes a list of five benefits that he enjoys because of his relationship with the Lord. And these are some of the benefits that we enjoy because of our relationship with our Lord and Savior. The first benefit is forgiveness of sins. The poet says, the Lord is the forgiver of my sins. Well, he actually says, the Lord is the forgiver of your sins, but we have to remember that he is speaking to his soul. Ever since Adam and Eve rebelled against God and decided to go their own way, the human race has been naturally in rebellion against God. Every human being feels a need to be in tune with the universe in some way. There are hundreds of religions which have been invented to attain the peace that is missing from human hearts, but only the Lord who has revealed himself in the Bible can forgive sins. The Apostle Peter told the authorities who had arrested him that there is salvation in no name except the name of Jesus. The second benefit that the Psalm writer mentions is healing of disease. The Lord is the healer of my diseases. I was in a conversation once with a medical doctor who was not a professing believer in God, but when someone in the groups talked about uh, physicians healing people, he objected. He said, no, physicians don't heal people. Physicians try to make the conditions positive for the body to heal, but someone else is doing the healing. He didn't use the word God, but by his conversation, we could tell that he meant God. God is the one who heals. The Lord is the healer of all my diseases. Now these first two benefits that the psalmist mentions, forgiveness and healing, were a part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And there's a story which is recorded three times in the gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which uh, illustrates this. The Lord was healing, was teaching a crowd in a house in Capernaum. And four men came along bringing a man, a paralyzed man to be healed. The house was so crowded that they couldn't get in. So they went up on the roof and they made an opening and let the paralyzed man down in front of Jesus. And Jesus looked at the paralyzed man and he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, there were some scribes there who thought that Jesus was blaspheming because only God can forgive sins. And so Jesus said to them, what is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or pick up your bed and walk? Then the Lord Jesus said to the man, the paralyzed man, take up your bed and walk. And the man was healed, forgiveness and healing. The Lord Jesus didn't always do it this way when he healed people, but in this case, he obviously knew that this paralyzed man needed forgiveness first. These first two benefits that the psalmist mentions, forgiveness and healing, are also found in a passage in the Old Testament that is very relevant for us right now. In 2 Chronicles 7, we find the account of King Solomon celebrating the completion of the temple that he had just built for the Lord. And the Lord appeared to Solomon, and he indicated that he approved of what Solomon had done. And then, the Lord, knowing what his people were like, gave Solomon a warning. A warning about the future. And one of the things that the Lord said is recorded in 2 Chronicles 7, verses 13 and 14. He said, 
If I send a pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent of their evil deeds, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. It may not read exactly like that in your Bible where the word if is at the beginning of verse 14. But in the Hebrew text, the word if is actually where I put it in my reading of this text. I will read it again. If I send a pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and repent of their evil deeds, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Now this passage refers to Israel who were the people called by God's name. They were a theocracy, that is, the political entity Israel was the same as the religious entity Israel. They were the same. We are not a theocracy, but if we have put our trust in the Lord Jesus, we are the people called by his name. We are Christians. So we need to pray and seek God's face and repent of any thoughts or acts that are not in tune with the name Christian. The Lord has sent a pestilence. Brothers and sisters, we have to pray. We have to pray every day. Our land needs forgiveness and healing. That means, of course, our land needs repentance. The psalmist who wrote Psalm 103 put forgiveness and healing as the first two benefits that we must not forget. The third benefit that he lists is redemption. The Lord is the redeemer of my life from the pit. Now the poet is speaking of a rescue of some kind from destruction. He might be thinking of salvation in general, but he might even be thinking of resurrection from the dead. But whatever he is thinking of, it is the Lord who is the redeemer of my life. The fourth benefit he lists is the benefit of receiving the Lord's steadfast love and mercy. That's a description of grace. Grace means that I receive all the gifts of God without deserving them in any way. The fifth benefit is being satisfied with good things. There is no ultimate satisfaction in the world. Only the Lord can give us true satisfaction in this life. Oh, but there's more in this verse. The Lord satisfies me with good things and makes me youthful again. Oh, I like that. The poetic language that the psalmist uses is exhilarating. The picture that the poet draws shows God giving him renewed strength so that he can soar through the air like an eagle, being set free from the confines of old age, and being given the ability to fly above all the restrictions of old age. In verse 6, the psalmist continues to talk about the benefits that he receives, but he does it in a slightly different way. He tells us of the characteristics of the Lord that are beneficial to anyone who has a good relationship with the Lord. He declares that the Lord is the one who makes righteousness and justice work for those who are victims of oppression. Then in verse 7 and the following verses, he applies this statement to the people of Israel whom the Lord rescued from slavery in Egypt. The Lord revealed himself to Moses and the Israelites. The Lord revealed himself to Moses. And Moses wrote the foundational books of the Bible. And the Bible is a benefit that we cannot live without. But of course, the Bible doesn't do any good if it's left on the shelf. Even if you have it on your coffee table in the living room and you keep it dusted and clean, 
and you never put anything on top of it, the Bible has to be read. The Lord also revealed his acts to the people of Israel. This revelation came through God's chosen people, but it's meant for everyone in the world. The Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he led them through the Red Sea on dry land. And when the Egyptian army followed them with their chariots into the dry path through the Red Sea, the Lord brought the water back and drowned them. He fought for his people Israel. And as they were traveling through the desert, the Lord gave them manna to eat when there was no other source of food. And he gave them water to drink flowing from a rock in the desert. He led them for 40 years in a wilderness until they came to the land which he had promised to Abraham and to his, his offspring. In verse 8, the, the poet quotes part of the Lord's self-characterization that he revealed to Moses as he was writing the book of Exodus. Moses had said to the Lord, please show me your glory. And the Lord said to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, Yahweh. This is in Exodus 33, 18 and 19. Moses was up on Mount Sinai and the Lord, and it says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there. The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And the psalmist is quoting this. He doesn't quote the last characteristic faithfulness that Moses mentioned in Exodus 34, 6, probably because it didn't fit into the rhythm of the poem. We have to remember that a psalm is a poem and poetry has a rhythm even though it may not be reflected in an English translation. But the four characteristics that he did quote give us a picture of the Lord that has to make us rejoice. The Lord is merciful. The poet will mention the Lord's mercy again in verse 13. And there the translators have used the word compassion, which is a close synonym for mercy. Secondly, the Lord is gracious. Where would we be apart from God's grace? Third, the Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is patient with his people. He led the Israelites for 40 years when they were constantly complaining and being ungrateful. He has led me for twice that long in spite of my occasional obstreperousness. Fourth, the Lord is abounding in steadfast love. The word steadfast love occurs four times in this poem. It sums up all the wonder and marvel of God's love, mercy, and grace. Now, after listing these four characteristics of the Lord in verses 9 and 10, the psalm writer reinforces his message by telling us four things that God will not do, that the Lord will not do. He will not always chide. He will not keep his anger forever. He's patient. He does not deal with us according to our sins. He will not repay us according to our iniquities. The Lord is a God of grace. Now, if this all seems somewhat repetitive, it was meant to be. The psalmist said at the beginning, don't forget. And hearing the same thing repeatedly helps us to remember and not forget. Now in verses 11 to 13 in this psalm, we come to a poem within a poem. Sometimes the poets of the Old Testament, that is the psalm writers, designed the form of their poems so that the main point they want to make is in the center of the poem. And this is what the writer of Psalm 103 did. These three verses, 11 to 13, in the center of Psalm 103, 
are the target that the poet is aiming at. He has spoken about the Lord's steadfast love. He has spoken about the Lord's forgiveness. He has spoken about the Lord's compassion. And now in these three verses, he draws some pictures which illustrate the Lord's steadfast love, forgiveness, and compassion. So he asks the question, how great is the Lord's steadfast love? Well, how high are the heavens above the earth? That's the measurement. In the time when this poem was written, the only way that people could estimate how high the heavens are above the earth were, were by simply looking up and looking at the sun, the moon, and the stars. But today, the human race has access to telescopes and other scientific instruments that give us an idea, a vague idea, of the distances in space. We can say the numbers, but they're beyond our imagination. The farthest known galaxy from the Earth is 13.1 billion light years away from the Earth. That means if we could travel through space at the speed of light, it would take us 13.1 billion years to get to this galaxy. That's, that's too much for my brain. But that's just the beginning of how high the heavens are above the earth. And that's how great God's steadfast love is for those who fear him. Then how far are our sins removed from us if we've been forgiven? How far is the east from the west? That's the measurement. In case someone would point out to me that if one person keeps going east and someone else keeps going west, they'll eventually meet on the other side of the earth. Well, that's not what the poet means at all. If I point that way with one hand into infinite space, and I point the other way into infinite space, that is the distance that the poet is talking about. And that's how far the Lord has removed my sins from me. How great is the Lord's compassion for us? Well, how great is a father's compassion for his children? That's the measurement. That's how great God's compassion is for those who fear him. The parent-child relationship is a completely intimate relationship. And when the Lord Jesus taught us to pray, or taught his disciples to pray, he told them to address God as their Father. The Father who is compassionate. Now we also have to notice a phrase which comes at the end of verse 11 and verse 13, and it's going to show up again in verse 17, and that is the phrase, those who fear him. What does it mean to fear God? Some translators water this down to showing respect or showing reverence for God, but the word is fear. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word is fear. Fear means fear. It's much stronger than reverence. It is extreme awe. It is extreme reverence, but it's more than that. If we think about who God really is, we might begin to understand what it means to fear God. It's not a craven fear. It's not the anticipation of something evil, but it's real fear. A writer in the last century, C.S. Lewis, understood what the Bible means by fearing God. He wrote a series of children's story about an imaginary country called Narnia. At the beginning of the story, there are four children who get into this country and find that it's ruled by an evil witch. But a lion named Aslan has also come into the country to defeat the evil witch. And Aslan is the Christ figure in this story. The four children were being entertained by a couple of beavers who were on the good side. 
Mr. Beaver tells them that they are to meet Aslan. The two girls, Susan and Lucy, are curious about Aslan. Susan asks, who is Aslan? Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Why, don't you know? He's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood. Is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Later on in the story, when the children meet Aslan, they didn't know what to do or what to say. The storyteller says, the people who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and terrible at the same time. If the children had ever thought so, they were cured of it now. So when they tried to look at Aslan's face, they just caught a glimpse of the golden mane and the great, royal, solemn, overwhelming eyes. And then they found they couldn't look at him and they went all trembly. When we meet God, we will tremble but we will also know that he is good. God is the creator of the universe. He is not our big buddy in the sky. I've known some people who thought they were so close to God that they could be flippant in their prayer. There's a lack of reverence among some Christians. Fearing God is not considered to be important by some Christians. Even reverence is often not considered. King Solomon, when he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he talked about many issues in, the book of, in this book. He talked about life under the sun, that is the life at a, at a, on a physical level. He discusses wisdom and folly, working and relaxing, laughing and weeping. And after he has discussed all these topics and more, he comes to a conclusion. At the end of Ecclesiastes, he says, the end of the matter, everything has been heard. You've heard everything that I have to say. Now, and I'm paraphrasing, what is really important? What really matters? What should be the main thing in our lives? And he says, fear God and keep his commandments. This is still valid for us in the New Testament era. Now at the end of the psalmist's poem, within a poem, that is verses 11 to 13, the writer says that the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Then in verses 14 to 18, the poet contrasts the shortness of our lives with the everlastingness of God's steadfast love. He says, the Lord knows that we are made of dust, that our normal perspective is from an earthly point of view, but the benefits that we enjoy, and he mentions particularly the Lord's steadfast love, the benefits are everlasting. Verses 17 and 18 emphasize again that these benefits are for those who fear God and keep his commandments. Now in the very last verses, in verses 19 to 22, the psalmist addresses the angels and all the heavenly beings. These heavenly beings are always obedient to the Lord, the king of the universe. 
they always do the Lord's will. But the psalmist exhorts them also to bless the Lord, you his angels, you his heavenly hosts. Then having gone to the far reaches of the universe, he comes back to himself again. He completes the circle and reminds himself again, bless the Lord, O my soul. Say it to yourself, bless the Lord, O my soul. <laughs> 